Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I trust you can all hear me. Good on you, Hayden. Nice to see you, Hayden. Um, Good to see you too. Welcome to Engaging for Success webinar um, today. Um, this is in our series of webinars around um, nature-based tourism um, uh, and the co-investment fund. Um, I'd firstly like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands that we meet and work on today. Um, recognise Abor Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, participating in this webinar. Incredibly important to recognise our First Nations people. For those people that I don't know, my name's Sean De Bruin and I'm the Chief Executive Officer for the Tourism Industry Council here in South Australia. We'll be recording today's session. I'd ask that you please keep your microphones on mute, um, use the chat function to make comments or ask questions. Um, this session is part of the Nature Based Tourism Capability Program and our partner is the Department for Environment and Water and we greatly appreciate their support. The key topic is community and Indigenous engagement and looking at best practice consultation processes to help with success for your nature based tourism proposals. Um, I'd now like to get straight into the formalities and um, welcome our first speaker, um, Steve Dangerfield from Pro Management Australia. Steve will be highlighting a number of elements for us. Um, social licence by various stakeholder groups. I think that's a really interesting concept, this concept of social licence. What does it mean and, and how do you um, pull it together? Und what underpins good engagement and how to work with communities. Um, looking at processes to ensure stakeholders' um, contributions are respected <coughs> and also a community of values and how they can be a part of the decision making and project process. So um, that's enough from me. Um, over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. That's all good. Yep, fantastic. Um, look, thank you for the introduction. Um, look, we've got we've got uh, the three speakers this morning. We've probably got a lot of material to work through. We've only got fifteen minutes or so, so we'll uh, try and be relatively succinct. Um, as Sean has introduced, it's um, this can be a fairly lengthy topic. This uh, question around social license. So this morning we're only going to be able to touch on a few key elements and uh, certainly happy to follow up with anybody um, post this session if you'd like to discuss more. Just a little bit about ProManage. Um, we're a small South Australian company. Um, we specialise primarily in project management services, but that we do have a small community engagement team. Um, there's three of us. Um, we are growing the team and we've, uh, we, we've uh, been involved over many years in a lot of exciting projects. So uh, myself and uh, Molly Gifford and Leslie Vopler um, head up that particular service out of ProManage. Just a little bit about some of the projects we have been involved in very briefly. Um, there's a number of pictures on the screen that you can see. Um, and each one of these is a case study in themselves. Um, the uh, the uh, uh, graphic on the left hand side of your screen, the large picture is a pump station that was actually co-designed by community. Um, rather than actually coming up with a, a preferred design uh, through um, which you would do traditionally, we actually designed this with the community um, who set a community brief and a set of objectives around what they considered to be social license. So we worked very carefully with them to um, deliver something that they felt would be um, amenable to the local environment, would uh, work as a gateway to their community, but would actually serve a, a water utility purpose um, um, in their community. So a very Steve, interesting sorry. In Steve, can I just interrupt you there just for a sec? Um, we actually can't see your PowerPoint presentation. You need to oh. go onto the toolbar down the bottom and share screen. Oh, we did that before, Sean. Um, so let's try it again. Um, try it again. <coughs> I don't know. Uh, Abby did have this working before, so our apologies for that. I don't quite know. Um, if you go down to the bottom of the, um, yeah, I'm, I'm the screen, you can see where there's a toolbar there and one of them says share screen. Yeah, yeah now I don't have that anymore. Uh, hop, hover at the bottom, Steve. 
hover at the bottom of your screen and it will pop up and it'll give you a green share screen. Okay, let's have a look here. All right, let's try it again. Okay, here we go. We did have this sorted before. And then you should have control of it and you'll be able to click through on it, Steve. How does that work now? Can you see that now? Yep. yep. Um, in, all right, how's that go? Perfect. Oh, excellent. All right. Must have been uh, when we were swapping presentations before with uh, uh, Ian and myself. So, um, all right, fantastic. So hopefully everybody, everybody can see that now. Um, so apologies for that little uh, technical glitch. Um, so look, there's some other uh, images here on the screen um, around projects that we are uh, heavily involved in at the moment, uh, or some of them um, um, at the moment. Um, we have on the far right hand side, there's a picture of a, a large ship and a port there. We're working with the community of Air Peninsula at the moment around a, a grain uh, harbour um, to uh, export grain uh, from the peninsula more effectively. I've been involved in community engagement work around site contamination, which is uh, the uh, left hand bottom um, image, together with uh, the clean up of the Islington rail yards and some significant work in Sydney around um, delivering a odour control treatment process in the, in the, in the uh, suburb of Mossman. And all those projects, just to give you a little bit of a feel for them, all of them have some degree of community concern. And without going through a process of engagement, um, a lot of those projects would, uh, would, uh, would fail um, significantly or, or at least uh, be held up in various approval processes. Um, this particular screen shows some other images. We're involved in uh, site contamination at the Amberley Air Base in, in Brisbane. Um, we've been heavily involved in uh, reviewing the future of the township of Lee Creek, and I think some of those uh, people on the screen today might be familiar with that project. Um, and right down the bottom there, the uh, family walking on the boardwalk at the moment, we're doing uh, some work for the Department for Environment around reassessing. Uh, the uh, the rebuild of the national parks and how we can reimagine the national parks on Kangaroo Island um, for the benefit of tourism and visitor experience. So that's quite a significant piece of work and I've been on Kangaroo Island for the last four weeks working with communities in that space. Um, and the final uh, image there in the middle is uh, the uh, uh, Port Augusta Power Station and the demolition of that station. That's quite a different project. Um, in the sense that we weren't building something, we were demolishing something, but the impact was significant for the community. So again, um, a, a significant project involving or needing to involve community in that process. Um, one of the things we come across time and again in our work is um, projects like I've described that go ahead without consideration for how the community might feel. And I want to introduce you to a lady, her name is Teresa, um, a lovely lady, and I had quite a lot to do with, uh, with this person. Um, Teresa is a, a mum, lives in the uh, uh, suburb of Mitchell Park, um, and was wrapped up with the site contamination issues of a few years ago, back in 2015. And this photograph was taken by the advertiser um, at a public meeting of about 300 people. And Teresa, I think, in her um, demeanour here expresses what happens to an individual when they feel isolated um, and not involved and, and not involved particularly in their own destiny relative to their community. And this is really my interpretation of social licence. There are varying uh, different descriptions, but I just want you to have a look at the uh, emotion on Teresa's face. She doesn't know what's going on. She's confused. She feels unheard, she's worried, she's stressed, she's angry, she's, she feels disrespected and unimportant. And none of us wish to ever feel that way, yet there are some decisions that get made that impact our communities that unfortunately generate this type of uh, feeling and emotion in an individual. Here's Teresa again 12 months later. Um, following a comprehensive engagement process. Um, and I'll explain the sorts of principles that we apply to our work in a, um, in a moment. So what of the work I've done over the last 30 years is, is really around these sorts of issues where communities 
do feel isolated from the decision making process and then um, we get involved and have to work extremely hard to turn things around and to re-engage with a with a community to ensure that they can feel comfortable with what's uh, with what's occurring not everybody is always going to agree with everything and that's not the purpose of the work we do it's more about how people feel treated in the process and here are some words that are quite critical and this is uh, Teresa 12 months on as we said who now feels engaged, she feels valued, she feels heard, respected, she feels important, supported, understood and involved. And I think that's the objective of engagement in my view, um, to ensure that people who for whatever reason feel they have a, a um, element of involvement in, in the decision making that's going on around them, whether it's a tourism project, whether it's an in infrastructure project, um, whether it's uh, site contamination, whatever it is that they actually feel in the, that the process that's been put in place to engage with them is supportive of their interests. We're quite familiar with this, I think, in this day and age that more than ever now and in the 30 years I've been working in this field, I feel that communities are far more empowered. Social media has uh, and, and the uh, arrival of the internet has empowered communities um, and they will very easily mobilise against your initiative if they don't feel that the process has been fair and reasonable to involve them in some way. So more than ever, members of society expect to be engaged on matters that impact them. And all too often, I've been in projects where um, the cartoon image there is, is a reality, that the project decision-making team is being railed on by a community for lack of consideration of their perspective. I've uh, summarised this very briefly for you. There are probably a number of other elements to this slide, um, but essentially I think there are four key reasons why people feel they want to get involved in a project. Um, they are reasons of financial reasons. If somebody feels that their um, property value or their hip pocket is to be affected by this project decision in some way. Um, quality of life, if they have a perception around their community or the environment and they feel that is going to be impacted. They will also get engaged if it's a health issue or they perceive that their health will be impacted or particularly if they feel they have a mandate in their community, they're a community leader um, and they feel that this project is going to be negative to um, the, uh, the community or the constituents in that community. So four key reasons as to or triggers as to why people might want to engage with you and your project. And the implications of getting it wrong are quite significant. Um, a, a, a community that is distressed and moves into the space of anger as a consequence of a lack of involvement or a perception that they should be involved and they don't feel involved um, can result in a number of negative outcomes. On the far right hand side of the screen, there's the image there of, uh, of negative reputation. Um, and reputation is something that is very easily lost and very hard to rebuild. Um, and reputation can um, far outweigh um, the initial stages of your project. I'm working with a client at the moment um, who um, maybe got off onto the wrong foot at the beginning of the project. Now the project is in the build phase, community are still very negative and ultra um, um, scrutinising of the detail of the project uh, may be unnecessarily so. And maybe if things had been dealt with differently at the beginning, that continued negative reputation of this entity in that community uh, might, might not be the case. Um, so other issues that result from getting it wrong, um, increased dollar spend um, on the project as a consequence of delays in approvals, broken trust, and maybe even a need to redesign um, if you're unable to actually uh, get those approvals that are needed for that particular project as a consequence of community opposition. So I think in a simple sense, in a project management context, you have two key options. Um, one is that you build into your project a contingency to manage 
uh, community concern, uh, community negativity, um, community roadblocking your project. And that could be significant. Um, if you get delayed in an approval process that is important for your development um, or your tourism project, whatever it might be, um, then that can hold you up and cost you money. So you can go down a path of contingency spend and, and identifying up front what you think that might be if this doesn't go through smoothly. But what that does to your reputation, as we said before, becomes difficult to manage. So the, op the second option is to engage. And then the question is, well, how do you go about that? My, my view in, in community engagement is to make it very clear. It is not about public relations. It is not about selling. It's not telling. It's not dealing with the project of uh, the community in isolation of project decisions. Um, and it's not this, this win-lose mentality. Um, there is a real difference to the type of work we do. And uh, while we do work very closely at times with uh, public relations agencies, and, and they're, they're, they have an important role to play, um, particularly in, in the media space. Um, but community engagement is not that. Um, it is a slightly different um, um, set of skills that are applied, particularly this issue around dealing with the community in isolation of project decisions. Too often, I think I've seen um, entities come along who uh, have a preconceived idea and have a view about sort of suggesting to the community, well, this is what we're doing and this will be good for you. Um, and communities may choose to take a different approach and say, well, we don't know whether that is good for us. Uh, bring us on the journey rather than just coming here to tell us. And I think that's the difference around the sort of work we do. So, just some words to, um, I guess, uh, counteract what we've just seen on the previous slide. Um, in my view, the work we do is really about involving communities on the journey. It's about seeking and acting on opinions and views and ideas um, through active listening and response. It's about finding common ground and working together to deliver mutually, mutually acceptable outcomes. And I use that term quite deliberately. I'm not using the term agreeable. Acceptable. Often in the experiences that I've had with a lot of communities throughout South Australia and interstate, people come to me and say, Steve, it's more to us about how we feel we've been treated. Have we been respected? Um, what's the process been to determine the outcome? And have we come on that journey together? As I said earlier, not everybody is going to totally agree with every outcome. That's not the point of community engagement. Rather, I try to aim for an approach where people at the end of the process can walk away and say, the process was fair, it was equitable, they heard, they responded, and I can live with the outcome. And I think that's where um, in, in place, in, in communities where there might be a little bit of controversy around a, a program, an initiative, a project, that should be our objective and our aim. Just a little statement here from Stephen Covey. I'm a bit of a fan of Stephen Covey's. He's got some really good principles uh, that sit in this space of community engagement. He said this, that most people tend to think in dichotomies, strong or weak, win or lose, but that kind of thinking is fundamentally flawed. It's based on power and position rather than on principle. Win-win is based on the paradigm that there is plenty for everybody, that one person's success is not achieved at the expense or exclusion of the success of others. And I think that's, that's a, a good, useful principle to use in approaching communities um, in, the, in the space of engagement. Three things I want to very quickly finish off with. The first is... Um, uh, in terms of approaching community engagement with a project or a program or initiative, the first thing to take account is knowledge, knowledge of the community. The second one is building relationships. And the third one is the process that you employ to deliver the outcome. Knowing the community is critical. Um, how does this community operate? How do they communicate? What are their communication structures? How do they perceive themselves? And how do you get into the community and become part of the conversation within the community? 
And when I talk community, there are a range of different elements to the community. Um, there are those who will consider themselves to be activists or experts in your space. There'll be site neighbours, there'll be landowners, property owners, there'll be regulators, there'll be council elected officials, there'll be the public, there'll be employees of important organisations in that community. It's important to get to know and understand them. And there are a range of tools you can use to um, identify their interests and their decision-making power within the structure of their community. And this is just one, uh, a power and interest rating. And it's useful to map those particular stakeholders against something like this um, in order for you to be able to appreciate um, where they sit in the community and therefore what level of effort you might need to put in, into play with respect to those particular groups. The second point we made is about building relationships. Um, is, I like this little statement, community engagement is essentially a relational process that occurs at a local level um, and works on the basis of mutual trust and respect. And here's some key words that are quite critical to relationship building. It's important that once you understand and know that community that you work with them in this way. The only one I'll point out because of time is this one around personality and style. It's quite important that the person that you're um, in, uh, employing, whether it's within your business or a consultancy firm, that they have the right approach, the right personality to be able to engage, to not, not come across and maybe um, not necessarily deliberately, but not to come across in a threatening way or in a way that, that somebody might perceive that they're, they're not actually listening to me, this is just token, tokenistic. So whoever you choose to lead your project into the community, the personality of that person is quite important. And the final thing I want to say is about setting the process. Um, there's a little um, formula which I like to refer to. Professor Peter Sanderman back in the early 70s developed this. And he developed it uh, largely in relation to site contamination and environmental um, impact. And he talked about this thing called the risk of a project. Uh, being the hazard and the outrage. With respect to the hazard, he talked about the facts of the situation. And he said very often the facts aren't the problem, rather it's the process uh, for engagement that is the issue. And so is the process you're putting in place genuine? Is it fair and equitable? Can the community see value for effort, for their effort? Um, that feedback and, and loopback process is important. And will the process allow the community to influence project decisions? In that process, you need to develop a vision which incorporates shared ground, find that, that common ground, find the community tolerances, allow for discussion and debate, provide for a sense of ownership, um, and ensure communities, as I said, can see how their contribution is impacting or affecting or influencing those project decisions. And my final slide is just a, um, a graphic to show you the example of a, of a, of a structure. We have put this in place, so we're, we're halfway through this process at the moment with rebuilding the Western Kangaroo Island parks and Seal Bay and looking at, at infrastructure uh, contribution into, into those parks and what that could look like. And we're working um, with all the sectors on the bottom left hand of your screen that interact with the parks to get an understanding of their vision of their view about how parks can support uh, visitation and tourism to the island. And we're doing that through a range of different methods, which you can see in the center of your screen. Um, together we're developing two um, leadership committees from those sectors that will work through the detail to help de develop, develop a framework document that will support the master plan for the future development of infrastructure in, in, that, uh, in, in those parks. The feedback loop at the bottom is critical and that document at the end of the process that you can see in the dark grey box on the right hand screen um, is very much an ability to be able to provide them with a line of sight as to how the community has influenced the overall outcome. So I'll leave it there, conscious of time. Um, 
Uh, I do have a couple other slides that I can make available, um, Sean, through the uh, through uh, yeah post post the session. Brilliant. Thanks, Steve. You covered a lot of territory there. That was fantastic, and we'll put that information that. Uh, slide deck up online and obviously this session is being recorded today as well. We are slightly behind time so I'm just going to keep moving um, and um, now introduce Hayden Bromley, Booker B Tours, who's going to talk to us about Indigenous engagement, um, specifically around why we need to develop um, cultural tourism experiences, um, commencing the journey of developing cultural safe tourism experiences, the optics, the benefits, um, and, make, and looking at the engagement as well around culturally safe Aboriginal tourism experiences. Over to you, Hayden. Just come off mute, Hayden. Sorry, I, I'm used to delivering, so I don't generally put my mic on mute at all, unfortunately. So, uh, uh, g'day everyone. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Sean and uh, Steve. Thanks for your uh, presentation. Uh, I want to talk to uh, this a little bit, and, and it kind of lends a lot to what Steve has said, but it actually extends beyond that. And the reason why it extends beyond is it's actually about, I guess, doing the right thing. So I want to talk about embracing Aboriginal tourism, and I want to talk about how to develop opportunities through culturally sensitive and appropriate engagement. So uh, as we're moving through with this, um, one of the things to bear in mind, and uh, and these are just a, a replication of what you saw on the website. There are some reasons for doing this. So when we're looking and when we're talking about uh, the importance of doing this, why is there a need? Um, how to commence the journey? A lot of people think they know, but they don't really know how to engage with Aboriginal um, Australians or people in terms of anything, let alone developing a, a partnership. Um, what it looks like. So the optics of actually getting together and developing culturally safe tourism experiences, uh, the benefits of delivering it. So what can you actually get out of this in the end and the dangers. So, um, and I think uh, Steve touched on a couple of the dangers there, but uh, we'll see how we go. So the first one I wanted to look at was this one here. You know, why is there a need? Well, uh, for a long time, you could quite, a, quite perceivably argue that there is no need. You know, this is Australia. We can move on. We can do whatever we want. And what we're starting to see more and more is uh, as Australians become more enlightened, as Australians become more uh, interested in other elements of the community, we're starting to see the, the rationale for developing culturally safe tourism starting to evolve. And it's evolving for a number of reasons. One of those reasons is because um, First Nations people, um, I don't like the word Indigenous. For me, it's almost as bad as calling us a native. And there's a lot of a story behind that. So I'm happy to talk about that to anyone later. But as an Aboriginal community, we have been marginalised. And as a part of that marginalisation, things have happened in the past and the historical record's quite clear. They've happened and they've denied and marginalised Aboriginal people out of the equation. Why do we need to do this now? Well, we're starting to develop uh, a clearer picture about what happened in the past. And a part of that clearer picture is how we need to move forward. And in terms of engaging um, cultural experiences, if you want to take someone out on a nature-based experience and you want to engage uh, with wildlife, yeah, it's great to get the... Um, get the fauna side of it so you understand what a kangaroo looks like and where they live and all of that but there is so much more we can do if if we develop the cultural element so we can learn stories from different aboriginal groups around the country about why kangaroos for example the old adage why they got their tail um, learns about behaviors and learn about things like that so those are the added extra benefits of embracing cultural tourism now around the world as you're aware, Steve, I'm not sure about the rest of the group who's tuned in, but uh, Booker B Tours Australia has been on the go now since about 2005, so we're actually into our 16th year. Um, and as a part of that, what we've done is we've predominantly focused on delivering a tourism experience to the international audience. Why? Well, our track record has proven, sadly, that a lot of the local domestic audience are not interested. and by engaging 
uh, with culture-based tourism and nature-based tourism on a different level, we can actually capture the interest of that local domestic audience. So this is where people can actually come on board, they can develop an interest themselves and they can help to, uh, to, to sell a, a culturally based tourism experience to the local domestic market. Some people think about this and they think about, okay, well, all I need to do is uh, go out there and talk to a black person. Well, that doesn't necessarily work well. And the reason why is because, as Steve has just uh, articulated, it's really important to understand the stakeholders and it's really important to understand the right way of engaging in it. So the right way of engaging in it might be identifying a local traditional organisation and then working through uh, that group to actually develop your capacity, develop and build bridges with people who you want to then get on board. That's one way. Another way might be if you're clueless in, in this regard and you don't know who to actually tap on the shoulder, it might be to engage companies like Booker B. So one of the things that we do is we uh, do cultural brokerage and we do community engagement and we build bridges between those um, who want to engage in maybe a cultural tourism experience and those who have got the knowledge and the, and the, and the culture to be able to, to flesh it out. So in terms of commencing the journey, it's not as simple as just ringing up and saying, hi, I'm here, I want to, I want to get involved. Otherwise, what you end up with is like Steve uh, illustrated, the danger, the frustration, the, uh, the feeling left out, the feeling devalued, all of that sort of stuff. Because pretty much straight away, when you're engaging with Aboriginal Australians, what we start to understand is you know, where we fit in the picture. So. Uh, in terms of how to commence it, start by being a little more strategic about it and understanding who the players are that you need to get involved. When we're looking at what it looks like, well, there's a whole range of things. The optics can be quite clear or they can be really murky. Uh, in terms of the, the operators that are working well, when you're engaging in um, culturally safe tourism experiences, what it looks like is seeing Aboriginal people delivering product. It doesn't look like uh, ticking the box, getting the tick, posting it on your wall, and then not engaging in the Aboriginal space, right? marginalising the Aboriginal community. That's what's happened to us in the past, and so we're very aware of that, and, and we'll call it out as soon as we see it. So it might be developing... Uh, uh, relationships, partnership agreements, there are a whole lot of things where it might be the case that you might need to actually engage on a deeper level. And again, in order to do that, it might be my organisation, it might be another Aboriginal organisation, it might be uh, Department of uh, Aboriginal Affairs and Reconciliation. There are places you can go to be able to work out how to develop it. Um, what it also looks like is proper business, business partnerships. So uh, when you're engaging and you're bringing one part of a partnership together, an Aboriginal community might deliver the other part where um, they might allow you access to sensitive sites on, a, on a, uh, a monitored basis. They might allow you access to stories or allow you access to places where what you'd be doing is delivering in conjunction with the local traditional custodians of that area. What are the benefits? Well, there's a stack of them. Um, so back in uh, 2007, Booker B Australia won our first uh, tourism award, eight and nine, and uh, by 2009, um, we were you know, into about you know, 10 or 12 awards. We'd also been inducted in the Hall of Fame here in South Australia. And the benefit is, People are looking for it. So um, more and more, it was an international audience. Well, we've got a bit of a problem with getting international people here at the moment, but this is where if you do it right, you can develop and grow a local domestic audience so that you can actually encourage them to take on cultural experiences. And it's happening around the country. So um, uh, those who are doing it right have actually sat back and they've worked out how to engage the community to actually develop a level of tourism product. Dangers? Well, Steve mentioned the dangers. The last thing you need is to see your 
in your operation splashed all over the front page of the advertiser calling you an unsafe tourism operator. So that's the worst case scenario, but it might be that uh, you know, you're know you out there, you've got a group of experienced seekers, you're engaged in a particular spot, and then you have people come along, along and challenge your guides. Um, it might be as simple as um, you know, you're wanting to go to Aboriginal sites or you're wanting Aboriginal information and people turn their back on you because you approached the wrong person and basically you've sunk your ship before you got started. So those are the kind of dangers. Um, I don't want to um, uh, label them too much because Steve covered a few of those. One of the things he didn't cover though was that cultural element. So why do we get involved? Why are stakeholders involved when we're talking about an Aboriginal space? Because we want to make sure that our community sites are safe. Now you go to the Flinders Ranges, uh, up there, uh, one of the sites which has been, um, um, sadly, it's been um, heavily impacted by tourism to the point that we've now closed it is Sacred Canyon. And uh, so now you can go there, but it's regulated and you go there with an, uh, a local Adnamatna um, guide and they will give you a contextualised experience. That's kind of a really sad thing that, that took place, but it's good that you can still go there and it's even better now you can get that contextualised experience to understand what you're looking at. Um, I want to rush through really quickly, and I'm, I know I'm going to be short of time, but I want to rush through a couple of things, and I'm going to just click through them. Uh, in terms of Aboriginal kinship, when you're wanting to engage with us, bear in mind it's not just blood-related, uh, so we have broader kinship things. So you might want to approach someone and say, hey, listen, we want you to give us a hand. And they might say, hey, listen, it's not going to work so well because there are considerations. Um, when you're engaging with us, I guess on this one, be mindful of gender issues. So you might be, uh, your organisation might have an engagement person who is male. You're wanting to go to a particular area and the people you're wanting to talk about are female. That may not necessarily work so well uh, and vice versa. And it could also be uh, in regard to age as well. So you're sending the, uh, the young people out to, you know, to uh, get involved. You send the young people out and you're asking them to uh, engage with elders. That may not work so well either. So just some things to be mindful of. Uh, when you're talking about uh, engaging with Aboriginal people, allow plenty of time. One of the worst things that you can do is think, right, we've got half an hour, we'll go out there, we'll meet them, we'll tick this box and get it over and done with. Because sadly, what ends up happening is people rush the process. And when they rush that process, what ends up happening is they let expediency, they let expediency override the process. And then when they get these hasty results, they don't blame themselves for being uh, hasty for being pushy, they blame the Aboriginal community for not towing the line. And this can be a major source of frustration, so we need to engage with it a bit better. As you're getting into developing your relationships, before you get down to business, you have to start to think about trust, respect and credibility. And uh, it's, it's important to do this. And when you're looking at a pipeline of works or when you're looking at a and a strategy for developing a community, um, a, a, a cultural-based uh, tourism experience. It's no good to say, look, we'll go and meet with them today and let's get it in, in chain for next week. It won't work like that. You might need a bit of time in order to engage and get down to the core business. Uh, one of the things to be mindful of is we're pretty, we've been burnt in the past by departments, authorities, you know, police, things like that. So when you're going to go in, you know, Maybe try and look a little less formal because when you're wanting to engage with us, um, sometimes we get our back, we get our, our senses heightened when we see people walking in in suits and ties and all that because the detectives, they're the ones who walk in in suit and ties and that don't go, don't, don't go so well. It's really important that when you're engaging with community, to ensure that you don't expect decisions to be made on the spot. So allow lead time. Um, you might go to, uh, for example, a, a local traditional council and you might say to them, hey, listen, we want to do this initiative. It's down on the bay. It's going to be really great. Uh, we need your, uh, your approval because we've got a bit of a, um, a quite timeline. Um, 
if you bully a community, and you might not even, you might be the nicest person in the world, but if you push people into a situation where they're forced to make on-the-spot decisions, what can end up happening is the wheels can fall off and they can walk away from that and thinking, hey, look, I don't necessarily think that's in the interest of our community. So allow plenty of time and most importantly, be comfortable with silence. Now, one of the dangers here is that for us, um, Aboriginal people, when we get into a group and someone asks us a question, in our space, culturally, we need to take our time, we need to reflect, we need to work out how we engage. And most importantly, that might mean reflecting quietly for a moment. The danger is in the, in the Western community, when someone doesn't answer straight away, we, we start to freak out, we start to lose it. We think that maybe they've got hearing problems or something like that, and we start filling that space up with noise. And that can be a problem because if you're asking someone a question, and then you ask a slightly different question because you think they didn't understand you, that confuse people. So we need to take time and we need to make sure that as we're going through this, we, uh, we do the right thing. Body language, uh, whether it be eye contact or, uh, or non-verbal communication, it's really important on top of that. And I can talk more to you about, more about that some other point. But what you need to be doing is you need to be making sure that um, you are on top of your communication. This is really important. Most of what we say doesn't come out of our mouth. And people don't understand this. And when they, when they don't understand it, they don't reflect that, by the way, you might be saying one thing, but the rest of your body is telling us something different. So we have to be very careful. And we need to be more careful because one of the things that we know is if, if someone's body language is at odds with what they're saying, we get... Uh, you know, we get hesitation, we get reservation. And what we try and do is we, we try and sort of hedge our bets. And if you're wanting people to come on board, then probably the best thing to do is to be open. We're not going to challenge you. We'll go away and tell everyone else, hey, watch out for that bloke because I don't get a good feeling around him. And if you're trying to develop a culture-based tourism experience, that's not going to work well. All this kind of terminology is the sort of stuff that we hear. And so it's really important that you are strategic in how you embrace and how you develop and nurture relationships. Because if you start off with stuff like this, you're going to sink your ship before you even get started. Because this is the sort of stuff that was imposed on us. It was impacted on us in the past. Be mindful of this sort of stuff as well. Now, I don't care if your best mate was Aboriginal. I don't care if you went to school with one. I don't care if you don't see colour because what you say when you're saying that is you're actually saying, you know, I'm a little fragile. I don't like to, for people to think that I'm a racist, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover it by doing that. And what it does is it underpin, it's underpinned by hidden subconscious bias. So in terms of moving forward, Avoid jargon, speak clearly. You know, we're not deaf, dumb and stupid. So don't shout at us, don't speak slowly. Just be yourself. And what you'll find is when we pick up that you're in there for the right reasons, that's when things will work well. So, you know, it should be good. And, and if you're trying to develop relationships and anywhere, this is how you can actually have a good recipe for engaging with people. So. If you're visiting our communities, and we're on the last couple of slides, if you're visiting our communities, just be mindful that it's not just a matter of jumping in your shiny little chariot and making your way in. Sometimes there might be approvals that need to be engaged. Sometimes you need to do your homework because if you've got to travel two hours to a community to develop a tourism experience, you want to make sure people are there when you get there. So it's about making sure that uh, you, know, you do your homework and, and you... Uh, and you but make sure you line your ducks up so that you can get hit it all in one piece. It's actually not rocket science. What we're really talking about here, when you boil it down, it's actually about being a good human being. You know, treating others with empathy, respect, dignity, compassion, loyalty and trust. That's what we're talking about. And, and I guess, and I know I've run out of time, but I guess 
if we can get this right, your tourism experiences, they'll be perfect. Yeah? And, and you can actually make sure that, uh, that you get involved. So um, I, I know there, are, there may be a question or two. I'll leave it to the end, Sean, so that people can actually listen to the next speaker first and stick around. But there's my details there if you want to contact me. Like I said, we do uh, community engagement. And, uh, and if you want to talk about how to get the community involved, um, that's, that's what you can do. I'll, I'll hand it back. Thanks, Hayden. That was fantastic. Um, time is ticking, so I'll keep moving. And if we have time at the end, I'll provide an opportunity for questions or comments. But please feel free to use the Zoom chat as well. Our next speaker is Ian Radbone from um, Department for Environment and Water. Um, Ian um, is involved with the Friends of Parks. Um, unfortunately, Ian doesn't have a camera on his computer, so um, he'll be speaking to us. We won't be able to see him, but uh, he'll be covering off on overview of Friends of Parks, um, how to partner with these groups, <coughs> best practice consultation processes, and give a few case studies, which will be great to see as well. So over to you, Ian. Okay, thanks very much, Sean. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my uh, computer here, so we'll see how we go. Um, let me just introduce myself and my background. I've spent about uh, eight years in the volunteer community space working for national parks. Uh, I'm a team leader uh, from a small unit called the Volunteer Support Programs Unit. It's, uh, it's a, a branch that works within National Parks Head Office. And now our role really is to uh, coordinate and oversee uh, statewide programs in National Parks. Now, National Parks is a decentralised uh, division. It has seven regional uh, uh, centres, basically, with districts. Uh, that uh, manage the day-to-day -day operations of parks. And our role really is to ensure that uh, community groups are integrated into that business at a statewide level. So we do the strategies, the policies, the advice, um, those sort of things. So uh, one, can everyone see this slide that's in front of me? Yeah? Okay, good, great. So one of the massive success stories really for National Parks is Friends of Parks. Friends of Parks isn't the only community group that is involved in parks, uh, but it's one, of the, it's one of the biggest and it's one of the most frequent uh, and uh, it's been with us for over 32, 33 years. So really, it's a, it's a massive success story. Um, so can we have the other slide, please, Abby? Maybe not. No slide. Um, right. Can everyone see that? No. Yep, we can see it, Ian. Which slide oh. are you on at the moment? Um, I'm on the, the front slide. Can, can people see the second slide? Uh, we can see slide seven at the moment. Friends of Parks Engagement Charter. Which slide do you need? I think I can... Oh, actually. <laughs> Which slide do you need, Ian? Uh, we've lost you, Ian. Are you able to come back on mic? We seem to have lost Ian at the moment. I don't know if you're still there, Ian. We've lost your video and we've lost your audio. Maybe while we're waiting for Ian to come back, 
Um, do we have any um, questions or comments for for Hayden? Please, if you uh, do, come off mic and ask your... Oh, hang on. Ian, we've got you back now. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm falling out, so just bear with me. Can we have slide two? Because um, I can't drive this from here. Okay. We're just... Um, Abby's just bringing that up now. Yep. So we're on slide four at the moment. Yep. We need to go up to two if, we, if that's possible. Can you see yep. the slides, Ian? You can see the slides? Yep. I can see the slides now. Okay. And just call them as you want them to come up. Yep. Okay, so it's 30, the Friends of Parks organisation is 32 years old. Um, as of last week, it's got 136 member groups, which is massive, and that's statewide. Uh, and it's growing. Um, it's made up of full members, and it's made up of affiliated members. The full members uh, usually work on ground with a park or a group of parks. And affiliated members are more uh, eclectic with their movements around the state. For example, sporting shooters or four-wheel drive association. They come on park, they do some work for us, and then they move move elsewhere. Um, most of the friends groups, particularly the full members, have a predominantly on park focus. Um, some are solely associated with one park. Some are associated with a group of parks in their district or their region. The, uh, the stats that we're pulling up at the moment for community groups working on park, uh, the 1890 figures, and I'm under-reporting on this, um, 78,000 hours, the latest hourly rate for volunteers from the Office of Volunteers is $43.64. You know, that works out 3.4 mil for us. As a, as a National Parks Division. That's a massive, massive uh, contribution. So this group, this organisation has skin in the game and they're a major player uh, and we treat them very seriously. Okay, um, slide three, please. Can we get sites, um, slide three up? Slide three's up. Oh, I'm not seeing it. Um, so there is a Friends of Parks Incorporation body made up. Okay, of all right. So, okay. So um, the Friends of Parks board is an incorporated body. So they provide sponsorship for uh, external grants for their members. They have uh, a constitution with very, very clear objectives to their constitution. Uh, we have 135 groups uh, signing up to reflect this constitution. And uh, before they sign up, they get endorsement from usually the regional or district ranges to support their activities. Okay, if we can go to slide four. Slide four's up. Okay, um, there is a Friends of Parks board. Uh, the Director of National Parks is a voting member on the board. It is made up of representatives from uh, statewide regional groups and they provide uh, support in a whole variety of ways to the member groups. Uh, training, uh, promotion, marketing support, um, networking, uh, uh, advertising, um, and importantly too for the board, they have a very strong advocacy role on behalf of their member groups. Um, the board can get a meeting with the director pretty straight away and also with the Chief Executive, John Schutz, with uh, uh, Environment and Water. So they're a pretty influential board. Uh, they've got a lot of networks throughout the department and through the department, um, other government departments. If I can have slide five. Slide five's up, and we've got, we've got five minutes, Ian. Okay, so, so, so the, the, the group is very eclectic. On any uh, one issue, uh, they'll, they'll align themselves along this spectrum. Uh, there's no, they're, they're, they're not a homogenous as far as social issues. However, you can see my little caveat there. 
Um, if we can go to slide six, they are very, very clear around their race on DOTRA, including the role and the value of parks. Um, they're very, very clear around the sustainable management and conservation of the state's biodiversity and heritage of parks. If, if you're going to pick one thing that the, the, all the friends groups are very, very committed to, and it's that single objective, sustainable management and conservation. Now, that doesn't mean to say that, that they're against uh, development per se in the parks, quite the opposite actually. But what they want to ensure is that uh, conservation biodiversity is managed alongside of the development, okay? So um, if we can go to slide seven, uh, National Parks have developed a Friends of Parks Engagement Charter. It really borrows from the Better Together document that was developed by the government and the sector in 2013. And that really is the basis of this charter. And if you have a look at the charter in slide eight, uh, really, if you stick to that as a principal document to engage with the friends groups, I think you, you'll land on your feet with them pretty well. Uh, activities, clear communication, uh, points around decision-making, uh, engaging with the Friends of Parks early in the piece, uh, getting their feedback um, are really, really essential points for any uh, communication and future engagement with Friends groups. As I say, they're very, very embedded in the local community. They are very well networked and they have an incredible knowledge base and an incredible capacity and experience in their parks. Um, but you can see the raison d'etre really is biodiversity and conservation, um, working alongside of development in parks, okay? So from my perspective, the key points for engagement with any friends group, engage early, engage openly with the groups. They're a great source of knowledge. They're a great potential partner in any potential development idea. Uh, their knowledge is extensive, their expertise is extensive. Um, they know probably uh, more about some of their parks than some of the ranges. Uh, they've been around a long, long time. I do uh, working bees around the state with small groups. Uh, the working bee I worked at uh, last weekend, the president was 79 years old. 79 years old. His network in the community is unbelievable. If you want to know what's happening in the area, you go to him. So uh, very, very committed individuals. Uh, and they're a great source of local community networks and contacts. So uh, my suggestion to everyone, use them. Uh, they're open. Uh, they don't bite. Um, but they want to hear, as, as part of that dialogue, uh, conservation, biodiversity, sustainable development. Okay. All right. Sean, over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Ian, and thanks um, for pushing through. We're just about right on time. Um, on the chat, I saw that um, Christina talked about the fact that the Friends of Parks um, guidelines is actually, um, or the Friends of Parks Charter is in the guidelines, in the funding guidelines, so people can have a look at it there. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any further time for comments or questions, but please, I encourage you to engage with our presenters um, outside of this discussion. Please go onto our website. We'll have a copy of the, the re recording of this session. We'll also have a copy of everyone's presentations. Thank you again to our presenters. I think that's been very informative. I really appreciate Steve, Hayden and Ian. It's um, been a very useful session. I look forward to seeing you all again in our next webinar. I'm sure we'll be doing something shortly, very soon. Thank you.